Good to see everybody this morning. It's like uh, everybody got wore out by Christmas. <laughs> We're down a little bit this morning, but good to see each one that's come out. You got your Bible this morning? Go ahead and turn to the book of Titus. Second Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. This epistle is only three chapters long. We'll be reading from chapter 2 of the book of Titus this morning for our lesson. I'll go ahead and read the whole chapter this morning, but we're going to look basically at one verse. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Of course, the Bible says in the last days they will not endure sound doctrine, but our charge as preachers is that we would still speak those things. That the aged men be sober, grave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works in doctrine, showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech that cannot be condemned, that he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Exhort servants, to be obedient to their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again. That means not back sassing. Not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Father, we come this morning with thanksgiving in our heart for each one that's taken time to be at the house of God. Father, we thank you for the word that we have to look to that will help us as we go through this troublesome time in which we live. Father, I thank you for each one that's uh, that set aside this time to be with us. And Father, I pray that you'd help me as I open the book and I might be able to give them something that will help us as we journey along together in this uh, pilgrimage that we have until we reach that blessed hope that the Bible talks about here and uh, we all meet together again in heaven. If you'll do that, we'll be careful to thank you and praise you if we do ask all these things in the name of Christ our Savior and for his sake. Amen. I want to look especially here at verse number 14. Who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. Of course, we're all familiar with uh, probably the most well-known verse in the Bible, John chapter 3, verse number 16, where it says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. But I'm going to tell you something. This, this verse that we just read here, verse number 14, I believe is every bit as important. This one talks about not only did the Father give Christ, but Christ gave Himself. Amen. Five times in the New Testament we have that same phrase, who gave himself. Five the number of grace, and uh, I was thinking about what I would do this morning, and of course I thought this would be an appropriate one to give since we just came through Christmas where people were uh, given a lot of gifts, but of course the greatest gift that was ever given was Christ giving himself. Right. And so we're going to look at some things here. Uh, this is actually part of what probably would be a series. You know me, I, I generally wind up having to cut off the first part of the series. I never even get to the second and third. But I'll go ahead and give you the three that I would preach if I was going to preach the series. The first one is, 
he, who gave himself for us. The second one is who gave himself for our sins. And the third one would be who gave himself a ransom for all. And every one of those is, is really worth looking into, really uh, something that is, that is important for us to learn. But I'll see if I can get through the first one this morning. Then maybe next time I preach, I'll go ahead and, and touch on the second one. But it says here, he gave himself for us. That speaks of intent and purpose. Whenever you do something for somebody, you're doing it for a reason. Like I said, we just came out of Christmas and people were exchanging gifts. And, and you know, we went out and we looked and we said, well, what are we going to get for this one? What are we going to get for that one? And you try to figure out, you know, something that they can use, something that will be, yeah, money's always good, sis, you're right. Um, but you're trying to find, what do you buy for somebody that's already got everything? You know, my kids are of that generation that, you know, they got everything. In fact, my, my youngest boy, they got two or three of the same things. They, they got two or three of things that they don't need. They got clothes hanging in the closet with the tags still on them. But, uh, you know, you want to do, what do I do for this person? The Lord Jesus Christ, it says he gave himself for us. Amen. Man, thank God he did that. There's a multitude of people out there that don't really care about the fact that Jesus gave himself, but I'm glad that he did. Amen. And he gave it for a purpose, like I said, when it says here, he gave for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Well, I'm going to talk about here five, uh, five things, six things, I'm sorry, six things who, uh, that, uh, that benefited us. First of all, he gave himself for us that he might have a people. And those people are, first of all, a purchased people. Second of all, a purified people. Third of all, a personal people. Then a peculiar people. A passionate people. And a performing people. All of those are in this verse. We'll see if we can get through it. First of all, it says we are a purchased people. It says he redeemed us from all iniquity. You know, when you redeem something, that implies that you were owned by somebody other than who you were redeemed from. Um, you know, if you, have a, if you have a savings bond, for example, we used to buy savings bonds for our grandkids until we found out how little interest they were paying nowadays. They used to pay, I think, 7%, but now, man, you hold them and, and it takes you forever to get your money back. But, but, the, but the government owns that bond. You pay for it, but they still own it. You have to redeem it somewhere down the road. And it's the same way with us. We were... We were bought back from something. The Bible tells us that we were in bondage to Satan. We were in bondage to sin. We were born with that old sin nature. And if it had not been for Christ giving himself, we'd still be indebted to that, uh, to that sin that we were under. But it says we were bought back. It demands a cost or a price of equal value to be paid. Now, what, is, what do you pay for sin? Well, the Bible says that we could never pay the price for sin because we were sinners ourselves. And the thing about sin, most people seem to think, you know, you, know, you become a sinner when you sin. But, that, but sin is a symptom. It's kind of like when you get the measles. You know, the measles, when they pop out on your skin, that's not really the measles. That's the symptom. That's the evidence that it's in there. Measles is caused by some kind of virus or or uh, bacteria, I don't know exactly what it is, I think it's a virus, right. and they say that's always with you. Even if you get over the measles, the Bible says, or the Bible says, uh, the doctors say somewhere down the road, they might pop out on you again in the form of, um, what is it that you get that, that's really, huh? Shingles. Shingles. Yeah, that's caused by that measles virus that's still in you. It's still in there. You've not been redeemed back from that just because you got over it. It's still there. We're the same way, you know, when you get religion, you can try to clean up the, the evidence of that sin that's on you. You can become a nice person. You go to church, you know, you can tithe, you can, uh, you can be good to other people, you can, you can give uh, to uh, different causes and whatnot, but the old problem's still there. Right. I sinned because I was a sinner. I wasn't a sinner because I sinned. Right. And uh, you need to understand that the Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but it's according to his mercy uh, that he saved us. In fact, that's in the next chapter, chapter number three, verse number five. Not of works, 
of righteousness which we've done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Man, thank God for the Holy Ghost of God. I'm going to tell you something. I, 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 miss, I miss the moving of the Holy Ghost in church, don't you? I mean, all of us here, we're, you know, we're the senior class. We're the older folks. And some of us here, I think most of us probably remember the days when you'd come to the house of God and people get happy and people get excited and, and the Spirit of God would move in the place. And nowadays, you know, they have to pump it up. Yeah. There is no move of the Holy Ghost, so we got to get out the rock and roll music and we got to get out all the drum beats and everything else and we got to try to, we try to, try to promote it. But I'm going to tell you, I, I, I'd rather have a service where you couldn't do anything. I'd rather have a service where the Spirit of God moved in and people were just, you know, the Bible said there is a verse in the Bible that some people like to use and says the, uh, the Lord is in His holy temple. Right. Let all the earth keep silence before Him. Right. And there's times for that. I, I believe there's times when we ought to just be, in fact, the Bible says in, in heaven when it comes to the judgment, the Bible says every mouth will be stopped. You know, the, you hear these songs on... And, 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 you know, I, I told you, I, I just really struggle with some of this contemporary stuff. Oh, yeah. I just, I, I'm the old, I'm the old hymn guy, you know. Yeah. I, I like stuff by Isaac Watts and, and some of them people back in, and uh, who's the one that was blind? Fanny Crosby. I, I, man, I like those songs. Amen. But we got these songs now, you know, where they talk about people trying to give excuse to God when they're standing, but Lord, we did this and we did that. And the Bible even talks about that. I know Jesus said many will say, Lord, Lord, have we not... But I'm going to tell you something. As soon as that mouth starts to open, <laughs> the Lord's going to shut it for them. Right. There's times, I, 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 there's been times, man, when I come to church and Brother Richard, when the Holy Ghost moved, I, I, man, I, I didn't even want to move. I, I was afraid I'd do something wrong. I was afraid, man, I'd get out of sorts. I, I don't want to interfere with this. Right. But nowadays, you know, we got to pump it up. We, and I'll tell you another thing that, well, I won't tell you either because then I might get in trouble. But... <laughs> Uh, I mean, there's just some stuff that, that just needs to be addressed. And we just, you know, sometimes you, you just have to let it lie. What's that saying? Let sleeping dogs lie. But we were redeemed. We were bought back from another owner. Right. We, we don't belong to ourselves. We belong to God. But then Satan came along and took us. But it says we're redeemed from iniquity. And the word iniquity here in the Greek is the word animos. It's, it's a compound word. The, the prefix A means no, and nomos means law. We were lawless. You know, the Bible says that God put down the law, the Ten Commandments. He said, thou shalt and thou shalt not. There's two. You know, you, you got to do these and you don't do those. But we didn't, we didn't pay any attention to that stuff. Right. Uh, we, we were lawless. We wanted to go our own way. The Bible says there's a way which seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. We walked in those ways. In fact, Paul talked about being dead in trespasses and sins, but we walked in those ways. Right. Uh, there was a movie uh, here a while back. It was called uh, Dead Man Walking. It was about a fellow that's on death row. And that's, that's where we were. We was on death row, but we was walking, man. We was heading towards that execution spot. Yep. And when, they would, when he would come down that hallway, man, I mean, that's, that's a tragic story. This fellow, he's heading for his execution and all of the prisoners would say, dead man walking, dead man walking. He's already as good as dead. I mean, the sentence had been pronounced and he's just waiting for that day when they'd either strap him to the table and put that needle into him and, and inject that in his arm or put him in that old electric chair or drop that, uh, put that noose around his neck and drop that floor out from under. He's as good as dead already. And that's where we are. Man, if you're dead in trespasses and sins, you're alive as far as walking around, but you're as good as dead, man. I mean, judgment has already been pronounced. Amen. But it said he redeemed us from all iniquity. And aren't you glad everything's under the blood of God? Amen. Everything's under the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Man, I like Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 25, where it says, Wherefore he, speaking of Jesus, is able also to save them to the uttermost. Right. There's a preacher one time he said man we've been saved from the guttermost to the uttermost <laughs> and that's where we're at man if we're without christ we're down in the gutter we're down there with we're down there with the lowest 
You know, well, I, some people say, well, I've never done this and I've never done that. No, but you've got the propensity to do it if you're a lost man. Yeah. You can thank God that you had some godly parents maybe that kept you from growing up into that business. Right. But you know, we got people today now that are growing up without any kind of supervision. They got no conscience. In fact, the Bible talks about in the last days there's going to be people who have had their conscience seared with a hot iron. Right. Man, they can do stuff nowadays. In fact, I just saw in the news this morning some guy... Uh, shot his wife and 13 year old daughter and they're looking for him they're trying to hunt him down man what what kind of a person can do that what kind of well we could yeah. I'm mean, just by the grace of God but it's not us right. but it said he redeemed us from all iniquity it said he able to save them to the uttermost that come to God by him it's all by Christ seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for us that word uttermost there, by the way, another, that's another compound word, which in the Greek means whole end. <laughs> I mean the entire end of it. He, he took it all away. But he not only wanted to purchase people, but a purified people. Hebrews chapter 7 and verse number 26 says, For such a high priest became us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than heaven. Amen. You want to know why we need to be purified? Because that's where we're going one day. And you, know, you can't get in there if you're in your natural state. Purification was necessary. And I'm going to talk about here in just a little bit, uh, this next one, the personal people. And it talks about there where we're His purchased possession. But, but the reason why we need to be purified, like I said, is so that we could be uh, found to be spotless. And I got to looking up uh, the... Because uh, the Bible says we're the bride of Christ. And I got to looking up the... The, uh, the ceremonies that they had back in the Old Testament, the Jews had, when they were going to get married. They would take that bride and she would have to go through cleansing. She would have to have some purification uh, waters put upon her to make sure that she was clean. And that's what we need. Man, we need, that's what it talked about here by the washing of regeneration. Like I said in chapter 3, verse number 5, it said, By His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration. David said, purge me with his, wash me and I shall be clean. Yeah. Man, thank God for the blood of Christ. Amen. It's the Holy Ghost of God that applies that precious blood to our sins. And when God looks at me now, it's just as if I'd never done anything wrong. In fact, that, that word justified, uh, somebody said one time, it means just as if I'd never sinned. Right. But it's a legal term. Right. You know, justification is a legal term. We were, we were under condemnation. But justification says, no, you've been set free. You've been uh, let go from that business. You're no longer under that condemnation. Right. So we're a purified people. Man, thank God for purification. Amen. It's good to be clean once in a while. Amen. Amen. I remember I, I, I used to have a gas station, service station, because my dad had service stations for years. So, you know, I've always liked cars. I've told you that many times. And, you know, whenever you work on a car, you get dirty. Man, and, and I don't like dirt. I, I remember my toolbox, when I would use a tool, I would always wipe it off and put it back clean. I'd look at some of these mechanics, you know, they're more interested in making money, so they're not worried about that. You look at, man, they got a layer of grease in the bottom of them drawers. Not me, I like mine clean. I like to be purified. I like to be clean. I don't like, to, now I can get dirty, but I don't like to be dirty. And so it says here we're a purified people. We've been made clean by the blood of Jesus. Then this next one, I really like this one, that he might have a personal people. It says he might, that he uh, might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself. Amen. You know, that, that, uh, that's a special thing, that you've been purified unto Christ. You know, uh, and I got to thinking about this. When I, when I married my wife, uh, she came unto me. <laughs> I, I don't know if I, I think I told you parts of my testimony I've never told you the whole thing but I remember when God showed me I was a lost preacher uh, he, he started dealing with me about several things and showing me some stuff from the Word of God but he also showed me stuff from life we went to a wedding one of my wife's cousin was getting married and the Lord spoke to my heart and said you need to uh, you need to take take notice of what's going on here because it's going to have spiritual significance and preacher when he got up in front he said uh, dearly beloved, we're gathered together here in the sight of God in the presence of these witnesses to join together this man and this woman in holy matrimony, which is a picture of that mystical union between Christ and the church. 
And I got to thinking about that, and then I started watching there, and, and he said, uh, when he got to the part where they, you know, the exchanging of rings and whatnot, you go to the man first. And he said, so and so, will you have this woman to have and to hold? That means he took her unto himself. The wife don't take the husband. The husband takes the wife. Man, I'm thank God. Now, some would say, well, you know, I took Christ. Yeah, you took Christ, but only because he took you first. Right. The Bible said we love him because he first loved us. I didn't love God. Right. I didn't even know God. I didn't know. Well, I guess I've always, you know, from a little child, I was taught there was a God. The Bible says, in fact, that they that would come to God must first believe that he is, and he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Right. So you got to know there's a God first. But, man, there's a lot of gods out there. But I, I didn't know God. There come a time when I wanted to know God, but even that was of the Lord. Right. He made me want to. It's God that worketh in you, right. both to will and to do. You, you didn't want to do it. In fact, some of you was dragged along, but, uh, you know, there comes a time then when you come willingly. But uh, it's a personal people. It says unto himself. Um, if, let's look at Ephesians chapter 1 for a minute. You remember I preached this to you a while back. Um, no, I guess it wasn't here, was it? It was at the senior prayer meeting. That's what it was, a prayer meeting. I was preaching from Ephesians, and I preached all of those. Uh, preached for six weeks on Ephesians and never did get done. But that's me, you know, I never get done. But, you know, the, you, you, there's no way you can exhaust the Word of God. That's right. I mean, you can preach the same, you can preach the same thing every week and still never, never exhaust the, right. the, the Word of God. But in Ephesians uh, chapter 1... The, verse number 3 says this. If I can get to it. <clears throat> Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. Right. To himself. According to the good pleasure of his will. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of His grace, wherein He hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of His will, according to His good pleasure, which He hath purposed in Himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times He might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him." in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Now notice verse 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of His glory. He realized we're a purchased possession, but we're a personal possession. You know, when I took my wife, I took her for my own. She doesn't belong to anybody else now. She's mine. You know, and if you go and you take possession of some other man's wife, you know what that's called, right? That's called adultery. That's one of the, that's one of the abominable things with, with God. It says... He, we are his purchased possession. It said he gave himself that he might redeem us. That's how he purchased us. We became his purchased possession. Man, I, I'm, you know, I'm glad I'm possessed. <laughs> we talk about people sometimes being possessed with demons and whatnot. I'm possessed by Christ. Amen. In fact, the Bible, I mean, that's literal. The Bible, Brother Bill, says that we have the Holy Ghost of God living inside. That's a reality. That's not just some concept or some principle or, or precept or idea. That's, that's a reality. Man, I mean, if you're, you, ever, you ever try to do something after you got saved and you felt something, something moving inside of you, saying, ah, 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 don't be doing that. Right. Now, in a lost person, that's called conscience. Thank God for somebody that's got a conscience. But in, the, in a believer, it's worse than that. Yeah. Man, I, I mean, it'll grieve you down to your very soul if you're right. really saved. You try to get away with something, the Lord, man, I mean, he'll whip you all the way back to the house. Take you out behind the woodshed, like they say down south. We don't have woodsheds anymore because we've got furnaces. <laughs> you got one. You got a woodshed there. Yeah, we need one. That's right. A lot of kids nowadays need one. 
It says, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. Man, everything that God does is for His glory. You know, the Lord doesn't do anything just to be doing something. I, I, I preached a sermon one time, you know, why is there a hell? You know, some people, well, you know, God's not fair. He sends people to hell. Well, He does. But there's a reason for that. Yeah. It's not, and by the way, it's not just because we as bad people. No. It's not just because we sinned and, you know, we got to put, be put somewhere. It, it's because God wants to manifest everything about His person. God wants everybody to see all that there is to see about an invisible God. Now, how do you do that? Well, the only way that we can see things about an invisible God is if He gives us visible things to see. And when He sends people to hell, that is an obvious um, means of displaying His righteous judgment. See, we'd never understand righteous judgment without hell. We'd never understand the wrath of God without hell. So in that sense, you could say it's a good thing. Not good for the people that are there, for sure. Nobody would want to go there. I mean, anybody who's right mind, you know, I've heard these people laughing and care. Well, you know, when I go to hell, I guess I'll just have all my drinking buddies down there with me. Yeah, but you won't be drinking. And they won't be your buddies. I can tell you that right now. What you'll be doing is you'll be, you'll be screaming and hollering. The Bible says there'll be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You're going to be down there in anguish. And that, but, but the reason why it's there is that God might manifest His person. But thank God, He says, you know, you don't have to go there. Right. That, that's what we're talking about here. Christ died. He gave Himself for us that He might redeem us from that business. But you know, hell one day is going to say, look at this. This is the righteous judgment and the wrath of God revealed visibly. It's just like marriage. Why do we get married? You know, why doesn't God say, well, just go out there and live together and reproduce and bring forth? No, because it's a picture of something spiritual that we can't see. But when we see it in the flesh, then we understand. Man, do you understand what God wants? The Bible says, therefore, when, we, when you get married, the Bible said, therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and cleave only unto his wife and they too shall become one flesh. Now, I'm, you know, we got all adults here, so I think I can say this. You know, when you get married, and especially back in the Old Testament, they talk about the bloody sheet. You know, you would marry a virgin, and the way that a man could tell that, it, that he married a virgin was there would be a, a bloody sheet there, the consummation of the wedding, the spiritual or a physical intercourse, we call it. We have intercourse with God. But it's not physical. It's spiritual. But yet it's the picture that's representative. Intercourse means a total union. Coming together. Intercourse. Coursing together. There is a sense. The Bible says that in heaven they're neither male nor female. They're neither given in marriage. Uh, neither married nor given in marriage. But there is a sense in which we are married to Christ. And it's that same thing. There's that intimacy there. That union. That oneness. Man, that's something that the world can't comprehend. How does a lowly man, a, a sinful creature, become one with God? Only through Christ. Man, I mean, when we get to heaven, <clears throat> excuse me, when we get to heaven, it's going to be something. We're, the Bible says we're going to see Him like He is because we're going to be just like Him. Man, that, man, you just can't picture heaven. We try to, and we still get that physical image in our mind of, of it being a place, you know, where we're going to. Go fishing and golfing and hunting. and uh, You're not going to do any of that. It's going to be all about God. <laughs> it's going to be all about Him. We're going to be, we're going to be up there at the, at the footstool of the Lord Jesus Christ, casting our crowns at His feet, saying, Worthy is the Lamb. It's a personal people. Man, I, I mean, He made this thing. He brought this thing right down to home. He brought it right down to where we live. I remember the time He come knocking on my door. <laughs> My heart store, that is. Yeah. And of course, you know, I, I have a problem with that, with them people talking that, using that verse where it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. That's talking about the church, by the way. It's not talking about a person opening their heart to Jesus. I've preached this to you several times. Je you know, Jesus don't want your heart. Give your heart to Man, I don't want to give my heart to Jesus. Why would I give him my old nasty heart? 
Bible says, I'll take that heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. He's going to give you a new heart. That's what it's talking about there again back down in verse number 5 of chapter 3. Where it says, not of works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration. Man, I'm a new creature. I got a new heart. You know, there was a fellow on TV, Bob Newhart. That, that, that'd be a good name to have. Huh? You know, Grap, that's... <laughs> Yeah, I caught all kinds of flack in school for that. Yeah. You, you can imagine what you can do with that name. Right. I mean, I've had everything called about, about that name. I, I, I'd rather have the name Newhart, but, you know, you're stuck with what your parents give you. you got no choice in the matter. I remember my dad did change his first name. His first name when he was born was the initial J. His name was J. Steffi Grapp. He didn't like Steffi, so he went and had his name changed to James. That's why I'm a James. I'm, I'm named after my dad, but his, his literal first name on the birth certificate was J. Steffi Grab. I don't know why they did it that way, but, you know, he didn't have no choice in the matter. That's what they, they gave him. Uh, but it's a personal people. Christ has redeemed us for himself. We are, uh, we are the one that John spoke of, John the Baptist, when he said, uh, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But then he that comes in later, he's the friend of the bridegroom. John... You know, John the Baptist wasn't in the church. John the Baptist, he never, he never was in the church. He was the friend of the bridegroom. He is the forerunner. He's the one that said, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He's the one that came into the world to prepare the way, make the way straight. But then not only do we have a purchased people and a purified people and a personal people, and i got to hurry, but it, we're also a peculiar people. Now... There are several ways that you can use that word peculiar. You know, you can talk about, man, he's peculiar. But, but that's, not the, that's not the meaning of this word. It doesn't mean odd or strange. It means unique. We're peculiar. We're different than everybody else. You know, there used to be a time when I could go and, and look at a car and I could tell you that, you know, that, that right there, that's a, you know, that's a Ford Mustang or that's a Chevy Camaro. Now you look and you can't tell what they are. You know, and, and half the time they don't even put labels on them. You know, if I, if I look at that little emblem, sometimes I can tell what they are. But a lot of them now, they all look alike. Yeah. But we're peculiar. We're not supposed to look alike. Right. We're not supposed to be like those walking around out there who have no God. When they see us, they're supposed to see us. And, and by the way, I don't just mean, you know, I, I told you that. I, I, came to, uh, I came to prayer meeting one day and, once and I was supposed to be. No, it was here, wasn't it? Yeah, it was here a couple weeks ago when Brother Jim was gone. I don't know why he's here this morning. Got me preaching while he's here. That's unusual. But anyway, I'll take it. <laughs> but I forgot my jacket. I went out because we got snow that morning. I had to go shovel the sidewalk. And, and I forgot my jacket because I came back in and took my big coat off and forgot my jacket. But, you know, it's not, I, I believe in you know, looking nice when you come to church. But that's not what I'm talking about. You know, I, I come from that legalistic age where, you know, your hair had to be trim, trimmed just right and you had to dress a certain way and, and all that's good. I still believe you ought to look good when you come to the house of God. You know, I don't believe you ought to come in here and flip flops and shorts and anyway, I'll get off on that. I get in trouble again, too. So but I, I believe you. ought. But that, that's not what I'm talking about, man. I'm talking about they ought to see a difference in our countenance. They ought to see something about a Christian that's got the glow of God. You know, you ought to be excited about being saved. Right. You know, walking around with the mully grubs all the time. No. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me, he said. Amen. Man, we ought to be celebrating. And by the way, this, this, this is the preparatory place. Right. You know, we come in here and it's quiet. It's, it's dead most of the time. But when you get to heaven, it's not going to be that way. That's right. Well, I'm just not made that way. Well, I'm going to tell you something. That new body is going to be made that way. And you're right. going to get it to it. And you say, man, I've been missing this. For years, where was I at? What was I thinking? Well, that's the problem. You weren't thinking. Amen. This is preparatory time. We ought to be, you know, and the Bible in the Old Testament, they were always shouting and praising God. And Baptists had been shouting and praising God until the charismatic movement came along. And then we was afraid we'd be identified with the wrong crowd, and so we closed our mouth. But God liked that stuff. He, he likes it loud. I mean, heaven's going to, in fact, the Bible says there's only going to be silence in heaven for 30 minutes. I really don't understand what that's all about. And I, you know, you try to put stuff in the Bible, you get self in trouble. I have no idea what that means. But it said there was silence in heaven for 30 minutes. Now, that, I don't know, maybe they just wore themselves out, you know. Maybe they just got so, 
so uh, so excited about screaming and how you ever get to the place where you just can't talk anymore yeah I, I never get that way <laughs> so don't hold your breath <laughs> But a peculiar people, it's, it's an indication and it implies the fact that they are from among many, one. They stand out. They're different than everybody else. Everybody's not saved. You know, we got this idea now everybody's a Christian. Man, I, tell you, I, I watch television and every one of them people claims to be a Christian. Yeah. Our president claims to be a Christian, but he sure don't live like one. Right. Nancy Pelosi claims to be a Christian. She don't live like one. I mean, I could point out all of them people all day long, but if you're a Christian, you better look like one. You better live like one. You better act like one. You know, how can you be a Christian, by the way, and never darken the door of a church? I'll tell you one of the, and, and, and again, I, I know I get myself in trouble. They may never ask me to preach again one of these days if I hit the wrong, if I hit the wrong topic. But, you know, I think one of the worst things that happened with this, with this COVID thing was when we started streaming services live. You say, why is that? Man, there's people that can't get it. I understand that. There's people that can't. It's good for them. That's a good thing. But it made it too easy for people to sit at home in their pajamas and just watch the service. Did, did you? And, and I'm sure you noticed this. If you didn't, you're blind. Man, I'm, I mean, there's something wrong. But ever since we've been doing that, our numbers have been smaller. And it ain't just because everybody's got the COVID. It's just too easy nowadays for people to sit at home. But the Bible says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse and prove me therewith, saith the Lord, if I'll not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that you'll not be able to receive it. Now you can mail it in, but that's not what the promise says. The promise says, if you bring it, I'll pour you out a blessing. Amen. You get the blessing for being in the house of God. And uh, you, you know, you can take that or spit it out with the stones I, you know <laughs> kind of like when you eat a cherry you get rid of the pit but but that's just the truth right. i mean the, the the more that we do the more that we do to make it easy on people the more they'll take advantage of it. that's just the way people are i i think we ought to say all right you know if if, if you're an invalid or if you're disabled you know or if you're You've had, like Martha, take Martha for instance. Man, Martha would love to be here. I, I don't think she's one of them ones just going to sit home and watch it on the tube. If she could get out, she'd be here. I think we ought to stream it to her house. But the one that's able-bodied, we said, no, you ain't getting it. I'm sorry. You know, you, you need to sign up. You need to be registered. And we'll, we'll stream it to your place if you're registered. But if you're not, you better get to the house of God. Amen. And oh no, a preacher can't say that because they'll run him off. You know, that's too hard. That's legalist. No, that's Bible. Right. Amen, brother. That's right. Amen. Uh, peculiar people. So we're purchased, purified, personal, peculiar, passionate. Woo! Man, there's one for you. Zealous of good works, it says. You know what a zealous person is? It's the little energizer bunny. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that, in fact, the, the, word, the word zeal in the Word of God, it means hot heated. It's kind of like when you put a pan on the stove and you turn that gas up, you know, or that electricity, whichever you happen to have, and, and that water starts to bubbling. You know, it starts off slow. You just get a little bit of oxidation in there and those bubbles start setting on the bottom, but eventually they start coming to the top. And my wife made some deviled eggs the other day for Christmas, you know, and you got to boil them eggs. And man, I mean, that water was just to going crazy. And I, it's the first time we've ever seen this. We, you know, you have eggs sometimes that crack, and the and the egg start. This one blew the end right off the egg. I mean, the yolk just popped right out of there, and there it, it looked like a baseball glove where the where the yolk had been, and it just blew the end right out of that thing. Now that's hot heated right there. I mean, that that took care of that egg, but uh, she was at, she was able to salvage part of it. But it says here, we're zealous of good works. Zeal. David said, the zeal of thine house hath... Oh, was it David? I think it was David who said that. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. David's the one who said, I was glad, Brother Richard, when they said unto me, let us go unto the house of God. Man, I mean, David liked to be around the things of God. Do you like to be around the things of God? I do. Yeah. You know, I, I, I just... I remember those days... When, uh, you know, when we'd go to church and we, 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 we didn't go to, 
get out, we go to get in. We'd be there for hours. You know, people, when, when I went to Southside when I was younger, back when Brother Dwayne Rutherford was the pastor there, right. people would say, man, you people are just in church all the time. Do you do anything else? <laughs> But I mean, you know, you, you get around the people of God and the things of God, and if your heart's right, you don't want to leave. That's right. Uh, I told you once before, I think, I had a friend when we were in Mississippi, he wrote a song, it was called, I Can Go to Heaven Without Leaving the Room. <laughs> that, to me, that's what the house of God ought to be. House of God ought to be a little bit of heaven when you get here. Amen. But instead, we come in here, you know, we talking about sports, we talking about hunting, everybody. I heard him, you know, at the funeral. Um, was that yesterday or the day before? I guess that was the day before, wasn't it? They were talking about going to some church that was having a game dinner. You know, everybody brings pheasant, and quail, and rabbit, and squirrel, and man, uh, you know, a raccoon maybe. I don't know, but man, I, I said, don't, just give me a good old beef burger, man. I, I don't go for any of that kind of stuff. But you know, we, we got all kinds, we got golf outings, we got game dinners and we got this and we got that and, we, and there's nothing wrong with some of that stuff but i mean most people you know that turn out for that when they never come to the house of god for something else you know whatever happened to revival meetings that we used to have to try to get people tuned up and tuned in everybody now wants to tune out and turn off that, that, that's the reason why they're going with all this marijuana business you know man it's going to be not too long we're going to have people that are either drunk or high on drugs I mean, that's just the society we're living in. But a passionate people, but then finally a performing people. Zealous of good works. You know why he created us and left us here? Man, it would have been nice if when I got saved, he took me to heaven. But he didn't see fit to do that. He left me here that I might be able to do some good for some other people. God wants some folks who are workers. And I don't just mean, you know, man, I'm going to tell you, like I said, we've been we've busy doing all kind of stuff, but... But I'm talking about working for Jesus, trying to get people in before the door closes. Amen. Bible says work, for the night is coming when no man can work. We're living in those last days when the Bible says that the wrath of God, the, the, the uh, cup of wrath is filling up. And there's going to be a day when that cup of wrath is filled to the full. Right. And that last person gets in that's supposed to get in, that last elect of God is chosen. And then God says, that's it. I'm coming for my own. He's not coming for anybody else. He's coming for his own. And that day's on the horizon. You better make sure that we're ready for it by working. While, the, while you have the light, he said, walk in the light while you have the light. Amen. And that's what we need to be about for the glory of God. Father, we thank you for this day and your blessings and your goodness to us. Thank you for each one that come out to the house of God this morning. Pray that you be with us in the next service. Now be with the singing, the preaching, everything that takes place, the shouting and the and whatever takes place, God, may you get the glory for it. We'll be careful. Thank you and praise you for do ask in the name of Christ our Savior and for his sake. Amen.